Oh, this is, is he called, called Corporal? This is Bruce. Bruce Halstead, and he's going to talk today on scams. Is that the way you pronounce it? I just found out how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody told me it was S-C-A-M, but I looked at it, it was S-H-A-M. Oh, it is, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Only a new I'm, letter can spell it. I don't know where it's <laughs> So he's going to talk today, and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Well, it is a pleasure to be here to talk to you. Can everybody hear me okay? Is there any problem? Mm. If at any time I'm speaking too softly, just holler at me. Sometimes my voice will go down, but usually it's fairly booming. Uh, I've been in Nelson for 15 years. I've been a policeman a lot longer than that. I'm not going to tell you how many years, but many, many years. So I have a fair uh, history with the uh, police department and with uh, public service. I was also fireman and uh, drove an ambulance, so I've done my share of uh, those types of things. But I sure do enjoy being in Nelson, and uh, it's really nice to be able to talk to a group such as yourselves uh, that are interested, not only uh, from personal points of view, but for general information on the type of things that are taking place in our community today. I look after all our uh, community relations and crime prevention programs uh, in the city and uh, you're certainly welcome to call on me or on our department anytime any of you has a problem with anything and I really want to stress that and encourage that. I'm going to give you some tips today that will help you as senior citizens uh, to look at crime overall. We're going to concentrate on scams and frauds, but we're going to look at some general things as well. First of all, there are three elements that are absolutely necessary for any crime to take place. A crime can't take place without three elements. They are, first off, a criminal. Got to be a crook. Secondly, there has to be an opportunity. And thirdly, there must be a victim. We refer to some crimes as victimless crimes, but in reality, there is no such thing as a victimless crime. As an example, when somebody does damage to some city property, we are all victims. We all own that property. It costs tax dollars to replace or repair that. When somebody rips the government, when somebody cheats on their income tax, people say that's a victimless crime. It isn't. You and I are victims. Because if the government doesn't get their money fairly from everyone, they have to up the tax for all of us, so we're all victims. So there must be those three elements any time there's going to be a crime. So let's first look at the criminal. A criminal is anyone who commits a crime. <coughs> Some people make a full-time living out of being criminals. There are lots of them that do. Others just stumble on an opportunity and then feel the opportunity is too great to pass up and they break the law. I suppose it would be fair to say that there really isn't any of us that don't have a little larceny in us somewhere along the line. We all like to take advantage of a situation sometimes and we all have probably in the past. But as we get a little older, hopefully we get a little wiser and it's easy to look back and reflect and say, you know, maybe I shouldn't be taking advantage of that. When I find that $20 bill on the street, maybe I should make an attempt to find the owner because it really might uh, belong to someone that really needs it. So when the law says when you find something, you must make an attempt to find an owner. Otherwise, <coughs> you have stolen it. Even by finding it, you've stolen it because it isn't yours. It can become yours legally if the right owner can't be found. So that's just a, an example. That's an example of an opportunity to commit a crime that every one of us can come across at any time. So an opportunity is any situation that allows a criminal to take advantage of someone to commit a crime. And that can happen at any place and at any time. The third thing we talked about is a victim. There isn't any of us that can't be victims, that haven't been victims, 
or that might not be victims. We all are capable of being victims of a crime. Albeit as simple a thing as a lawn ornament start stolen from your yard. And we look at it and say, what an inconvenience. But you are a victim. Whoever stole that lawn ornament from you had no right to it. You have to replace it. It not only costs dollars, it costs time. It can cause a lot more stress for some people than others. You work hard and do have a beautiful garden and some kids come and raid your garden and do all kinds of damage. You're a victim. Any of us can be a victim at any time. It's the amount of seriousness, uh, the way it affects us, that makes us more a victim or less a victim. But some people can be very, very traumatized. I can give you an example of a couple that had their house broken into. They literally became prisoners in their own home because they were afraid to leave their house after that. One of them would leave and the other would stay, thinking that person might come back and break into our home again. There's probably not any more crime that's more traumatizing to a person as far as a property offense is concerned than having your home, your castle, broken into, your privacy invaded. It's a very, very traumatizing thing. So it can be, you can be a, a victim both physically, emotionally, just about always financially. There's always some cost involved usually to a crime that's committed against you somewhere along the line. And for petty crimes, a great deal of inconvenience. And there isn't any of us like to be inconvenienced. You know, we like things to s flow nice and smoothly. And as citizens, we have that right to expect that to happen. We have the right to expect that these things aren't going to happen to us. So, now we've got to talk about a few things that we can do to prevent crime. All of us, we're all crime fighters. The only reason I'm wearing the blue suit is because you people hired me to wear it. You passed on your responsibility and authority to me. That's how the police came about. You were the peacekeepers in common law, all of you. And way back in history one time, it was your turn to be the peacekeeper and you hired her to be the peacekeeper. She did such a good job, you said, I think we'll call her a constable. <laughs> and she'll be the peacekeeper. But in law, you are still peacekeepers. That responsibility has never been taken away from you. You still have the right, every one of you as citizens, to arrest somebody for breach of the peace. Without a warrant, to make an arrest, a citizen's arrest, or for any serious crime that you see being committed. So, we have to look at realities. The law says you may arrest somebody that's breaking the law. You may arrest somebody that's uh, uh, about or is breaching the peace doesn't say you must. So then what would, it, what would you think would be a logical solution if you're not physically able to grab some young guy that's breaking into a house? Call the police. That's how you can become crime fighters. Too often we have people call us and say, about two o'clock this morning I was wo uh, woken up and there was a loud crash and I looked over and saw a couple of young fellows running from my neighbor's house. Now, my neighbor is away on holidays, and it's really been bothering me, so I thought maybe I should phone you. And this is 10 o'clock in the morning, rather than phoning us right then when it was happening. So it's important when you see something taking place to give us a call. Then we'll act on your behalf, and we'll make the arrest, or try to. We'll do our darn best, I promise you that. So, police can't work alone. We depend on you, the community, to be our eyes and our ears, and, in fact, be part of being crime preventers within the police community and within your own community. Police and community working together to prevent crime. That's one of our models. And that's the only way we can complete the task. We can't be everywhere at once. We only have 16 police officers in the city of Nelson. 
and we're growing leaps and bounds. We could not operate without your assistance and cooperation. Couldn't happen. So we've got to look at removing one of those three elements. And if we remove any one of those three elements, we don't have crime. If we remove the criminal, we remove the opportunity, or we make ourselves not available to be victims. Any one of those three things, and we don't have a crime. Now let's talk about scams for a few minutes. Scams are something, especially in the springtime, that come along in every community every year. We have had a fair bit of them in our community this year. We have a file ongoing. I'm going to run over a few of the more common ones, and then we can discuss uh, some of the things that take place, and, and I'll certainly entertain questions from any of you at any time. So if you have something to, on topic uh, that, we have, that uh, we're talking about at the moment, and you have a question about it, please just interrupt. I'm glad to talk about it. Yes? Why especially springtime? Well, it seems that that is when home repairs start to be done, is spring, and that's why uh, it's prevalent for that type of scam to take place in the spring. Uh, people are starting to think about home beautification and uh, painting up and putting new roofs on and those kind of things. It, is that common to all communities? Yes. Um, at the coast it goes on all year because their climate is much more, uh, you know, the people can work all year outside, but uh, the, the majority of times that type of scam, and we're going to cover that in some fair detail, that takes place is when somebody sees, they drive by your house, take a look, and maybe the uh, soffits need a little bit of paint or something, and they come and knock on your door. They come soliciting you as a client and in some cases as a victim. The first scam I'd like to talk about is the bank examiner. Now we haven't had this happen in Nelson for some time, but it does happen in a lot of communities and it certainly could happen here anytime. What happens is that usually you'll get a phone call and the person will pretend to be the manager or an investigator from the financial institution where you deal, either the credit union or one of the banks. And they'll say, listen, we've got a problem in our bank. Somebody inside the bank is stealing large, large amounts of money out of people's accounts. We'd like you, as a good citizen, to help us catch that crook. So right away, you think, yeah, this sounds good. I'm going to be a crime fighter. What they'll ask you to do is Go to the bank and withdraw a large amount of money from your account. They'll first of all ask you about the accounts that you have, and then they'll say, uh, have you got 5,000 in that account? Yeah. Would you go and withdraw 5,000 from that account, please? I'll be watching you so nobody can get at you and steal, and I'll meet you outside the bank immediately when you're finished, and then we can go in and return the money, but I want to make sure this person is giving you all the money that uh, is required. You've never seen the person, you've never met them, but they know you. Now there are many ways of them getting to know you. Voters lists, all kinds of things. You know, there are public lists stating who you are and where you live. Telephone, just go through the telephone directory. It'll do that. So these are, that's one way that it can happen. Now what I'm suggesting to you, if that ever happens to you, immediately say, no, I'm not interested, and then phone the police immediately and phone the financial institution and advise both of them. And don't speak to just anyone, ask to speak to the manager. And speak to the manager and to the police and let them know what has just taken place so that we can be alerted to this type of thing going on. And so that we can alert the rest of the community so that one of your friends isn't taken advantage of that isn't here today and that you haven't been able to pass this information on to. Another type of fraud is medical frauds. Scams, 
selling medicine that are guaranteed to uh, cure everything, every ache and pain there is, or, or uh, medical devices such as the latest in wheelchairs that uh, is worth $10,000 when it's worth $2,000. You know what I mean? Those type of scams. In the old days, they used to have the uh, horse doctor would go around and sell Cherokee's rattlesnake oil. I think you all remember the days of, of uh, seeing that on television, probably in the early television days. And it was guaranteed to um, get you drunk and fix every ailment that there was. So they sold it for absolutely every purpose there was. And they were real smooth talkers. The people today are, are better educated the crooks are better educated and they're better talkers. I promise you that on many occasions, once you meet them or once you start to talk to them, you'll think they're the nicest person in the world. I'll give you a few tricks for not being taken advantage of when just when we're going to close. Home improvement frauds. These are the ones we talked about that seem to be pre prevalent in the spring. Roofs, soffits, siding, windows, Heating, fence, your fence is a little crooked or, or a little paint, people will knock on your door. Now, we've got lots of good business people in our community, a lot of good ones. Most of the good ones are really busy. But more times than not, this isn't always the case, so I can't say it blanket, but most times if somebody knocks on your door and wants your business of this type, you're best not to do business with them. The best type is if you call them, not them call you. Because they'll take you and say, boy, your roof is going to fall, your house is going to rot out in, within a year. The whole roof is going to need replacing and it's going to cost you $20,000. That's a common thing when the shingles start to curl and they get some moss on them and things like that. We all know that the life expectancy of shingles is anywhere between 10 and 25 years, you know, for a regular asphalt shingles. But in the meantime, they can look absolutely horrible, even when they're still working good. But they can look terrible. Now, if an outfit is doing some roofing next door, it's not uncommon for them to talk over the fence and say, we'll give you a deal while we're here. And there's an opportunity for you to see what type of work is being done next door, and then to compare price. You say, sure, I'm interested, but give me an estimate written. And before you accept his estimate, you get at least two more. Never get any work done on the exterior interior of your home without getting at least three estimates for any type of work other than something we're talking about, nailing, hanging a door for $50 or something. We're talking about some major work, you know, into a thousand or so dollars. Get some estimates. I'll give you an example. My mother-in-law lives out the lake. And a couple of young guys knocked on their door and they said they needed new soffits. They had a new roof put on and they said, Phew, your roof, that beautiful roof here is going to collapse and fall in within a year. They said, we'll do it for you for $4,000. $4,000. We'll put all new soffits and eaves drops on your place. So, oh. I was away in Europe at the time, so they said, oh, you betcha. So they gave them a check for $2,000. The guy came, within a week, did the work. It took one day for one man to do the work for $4,000. I got home before they paid the second $2,000. I said, you've just been scammed. We phoned up three more contractors, and the highest price from three reputable local contractors was $800 for the same work. So we took them to court. We took them to small claims court and recovered uh, the, got the uh, second 2,000 stopped and recovered some of the first 2,000. But we were very fortunate. Now this just shows that it can happen to anyone very, very easily. They thought these were the nicest two young men they'd ever met. They couldn't cheat them. 
really shows you that you can be taken advantage of quite simply. If somebody knocks on your door, I suggest one thing, you don't invite them in if they're trying to do home improvements. You ask to see a business license, because most of these guys don't have a business license. And you say, yeah, I need that work done, if you, if you do need it done. But say, leave me a written estimate, I want to get others. Above all, don't give a deposit. Never, ever give a deposit. The law allows you to sign a contract if somebody knocks on your door and to breach that contract within seven days. You're allowed to do that. You, don't, you can't be held to that contract if they knock at your door. Now, it's different if you phone them up and they come to your house, you look in the yellow pages and find uh, Joe Blow's construction and you invite them to your house and you then sign a contract. I'm saying don't sign a contract even with him until you have at least two more. Wait till you have at least three contracts so that you can look at them. Make sure that they're all doing the same work so that you can compare them. And then you can say, oh, okay, I think we'll take advantage of this person. He may be $200 more than this guy, but he's doing a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with having somebody from Kelowna or the Okanagan doing your work for you. There's nothing wrong with having somebody from Trail or Castlegar doing your work from, for you. But it's much easier to deal with people that are local. I suggest, only a suggestion, that most times you're better off to deal with somebody that you know has been in business in your community for some time and you've seen some results of their work. Never let the person start doing the job right away. And above all, like I said, don't give them a deposit until, until you're ready to sign a contract and make a decision based on the other three contracts that you've received. Then what you do is you look at them and you say, okay, now, the person usually will want some money up front to purchase the materials. And if he's a reputable person, has been in your community for a long time and licensed here and uh, deals here and works here, there shouldn't be a problem. If there is a problem, you'll have some recourse because he's still a local person. It's much easier to deal with a person that's local than a person that's far away. So you want written uh, contracts. Talk to your neighbors. Ask the person. Say to them, who else have you done work for? Get some names and phone numbers. Phone them up and say, are you satisfied with this man's work? You know, we're all a small enough community and we all know each other well enough that you can usually talk to some neighbors and say, what about Joe Bowe's outfit? Does he do a good job? Or, or uh, Mr. Wicklum's roofing, as an example. He's been around here for years and years and years. Now, you don't stay in business for years and years. If you're cheating people, you soon get chased out of town. So that's a good example. So don't give a cash deposit until you've looked at the estimates and had a chance to decide after that uh, what, how the estimates compare and what, what you're getting done for your dollar. If you're ever in doubt, check them out. If you're ever in doubt, <coughs> check them out. Now here's where you can check them out. You can call the local police department. We're glad to answer what we know about a business. Check with your bank manager. That's where you're going to write your check from. Check with your lawyer if you're going to sign a contract. Most of you will have a lawyer or just ask the lawyer. Is this a good contract for me to sign? Is it in my best interest? Now a lawyer's fee is very, very small usually in, in when, it, when it comes uh, in a, comparing it to what a large uh, amount of work on your property would be. Ask to see a business license and don't hesitate to talk to the business license inspectors or the building inspectors both at the city and the regional district. The building inspectors there can certainly tell you about the various builders and uh, tradespeople in our community. Telemarketing is another thing that can really get you. There's a lot of people get phone calls and told that they've won something. 
Here you are, you've never entered a contest, but you're the winner of something. Yeah, just a while ago. Did you enter a contest? No. No. Did you win something? No. no. You can bet. If they're telling you to collect a hundred dollar gift, nobody gives something for nothing these days. If they're trying to get you to collect a hundred dollar gift, it's going to cost you two hundred to get that hundred. <laughs> if you've entered a legitimate contest, that's run and governed by rules and regulations, there isn't a problem. But most times when you get a phone call and say, you've just been, you've just won or you've just been selected, you know it's a scam. You haven't won anything. Photographs, family photographs are one of the most common. There's a lot of good family portrait uh, photographers out there that do a heck of a good business. But there's a lot of scams as well. They pick you up and call. You've just won a beautiful 9 by 12 picture, absolutely free. Come down and get it. So they take a whole bunch of them and sell you a $200 package. Think about those things. Mail order. Don't ever accept something in the mail that you didn't order. If something comes in the mail and you didn't order it, put return to sender on it and drop it back in the box. If it wasn't ordered by you from a company, don't take it, because usually there's a hook attached to it. And the last thing that I'd like to mention to you is charities. Not very often in a smaller community does this happen, that someone knocks on your door and pretends to represent a charity that, that they don't represent or that it's not existent. Anybody that's collecting for a charity will have proper identification plus the campaign will be well advertised on television and radio at the particular time, such as our Red Shield Appeal and our uh, um, Cancer and Heart Fund and United Way, those kind of things. They're well advertised and the people will all have ID. So if somebody comes and knocks on your door and wants something from the charity, number one, you want a receipt, and number two, you want some ID and you should be aware that it's taking place. If in doubt, check them out. So it's important to be alert. Pay attention to your instincts. We've all got to be the age we are by being survivors, by having that sixth sense. And if you think something's wrong, if you can kind of smell a rat, most times there's a rat involved. So remember that. Pay attention to your instincts. Don't be afraid to ask for advice or help from somebody else, from a friend or neighbor. That's nothing to be ashamed of. That doesn't mean to say you're not as bright as the next person. Don't hesitate to call on the police. We're glad to do home security checks for you. It's as easy as a phone call. Alarms are a great way to prevent uh, crime in relation to your property. There are very good companies that put in, putting in alarms today. They're in the yellow pages. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Check them out. Phone answering machines. Now I know that lots of us hate to talk to a stupid machine when we phone somebody, but I'll tell you, it's your best security that you could ever hope to have. Number one, it never lets a person know if you're home or not. Because the message you give on that machine is, this is, uh, I'll give my phone number, 229-5610. We are unable to come to the phone right now, but please leave a message and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. It doesn't tell them that I'm home or not. Most crooks won't take a chance. They want to know for sure. Plus, when that rings, you can hear it. If you wish, when I start to leave my message, if I'm phoning Mrs. Smith to uh, ask her to come down to the police station to talk to us about something, she puts her answering machine on, she, it rings, now comes the beep for me to talk, and I say, this is Bruce Halstead from the police department. All you have to do is pick up your phone, dial zero, and you're talking to me. It's that simple. So it lets you screen your calls, or you let my message go through, and then you return the call to me. No big deal. It's something that none of us are used to, 
you know, and we, we look at them as a pain, especially with a lot of the major organizations going to uh, the uh, phone slot systems where you have to press this to get this kind of an answer and press this to get this kind of an answer. But a telephone answering machine really is a simple tool that's of real value to most of you. It can be. When you're doing any landscaping or planning on your property, keep security in mind. If you're in doubt, give us a call. We'll, we'll be glad to give our advice in this regard. If you're going on vacation, make sure you've got somebody looking after your house and making it look, making it look lived in. Somebody that's looking after the property daily. Not letting the papers pile up and the lawn get too long and those kind of things. If you find that you are a victim of any type of crime, please call us. We're glad to investigate it. That's what we're paid for. We also have a victim services worker now in the police department, attached to the police department, who can give advice, who can channel you to the right direction to get the little things looked after. Many times we'll have people have a major theft in their home and they just think they're out the money. They forget that they've been paying house insurance for that purpose. Our victim's assistance worker will certainly steer them in the right direction. We have three victim's assistance programs in the city. We're very fortunate. One is police-based, one is community-based, and they deal more with the sexual assaults and family assaults, and the other is uh, crown-based, uh, which means uh, at the uh, prosecutor's office, and they walk a person through the court process if they have to be a witness or anything like that, so it's not uh, strange to them. All of these services are provided by your tax dollars. I'll just read off some, quickly some tips to pre help you prevent uh, yourselves from being victims of fraud. Never turn any sizable amount of money to anyone, especially strangers offering to help with a get-rich-quick scheme. Do not become involved in secret deals and plans, such as the bank examiner. Completely ignore it, call right away. Do not send money through the mail for any offer. Never send money through the mail. If it sounds too good to be true, you can rest assured that it is. Don't rush into any deal. Be aware of unsolicited bargains. Give yourself time to think about any deal that someone's offering you. Verify the authenticity of any suspicious representative. <laughs> Find out more about the organization that they're representing. Get an address and a phone number. Look them up in the phone book. See if they exist. Check with the business license. See if they exist. If they check, I'm on the order. Can send them in the mail. I beg your pardon? If they check, I'm on the order. Can send them in the mail. That's right. So don't don't be sucked in by somebody. Cash that, money can send. Don't give them any money. No money up front. Never sign a contract until you've read it thoroughly. Don't give your credit card numbers out over the telephone unless you're talking to someone that you know, you know, where, it, where it's a proper transaction. And check all medical and health related uh, offers. Check it through your doctor or through the hospital or through a physiotherapist. And if you're suspicious, above all, call the police. Now I'd like to just read one little thing to you, written by a Ruth Sharon. And I've taken this out of a handbook that was put out by the uh, senior citizens in Trail. And I really think it's applicable. It's called an assertive bill of rights. It's really important that all of you are assertive and exercise your rights. Don't be taken advantage of just because you're getting a little uh, gray on top and a little senior in years, don't let people take advantage of you. The Assertive Bill of Rights. I have the right to be responsible for my own life, to accept and respect myself and others, to feel happy, satisfied, and allow inner peace, to take good care of my whole being, my body, my mind, my spirit, to be imperfect, 
to be aware and to fulfill my own needs, to have dreams, goals, ideals, and to make them happen, to have and express all my emotions, to tell others how I want to be treated, to allow people to help me without feeling guilty, unworthy, or dependent, to set my own priorities about my use of time, money, space, and energy, to get what I pay for, to have healthy, life-enhancing relationships where clear communications is valued, to make conscious decisions to change relationships, to change, emerge, expand in new directions, to have my own beliefs, ideas, values without apology to anyone, to live in the present moment free of guilt in the past and worry for the future, to relax, to let go, and to do nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I've really enjoyed talking to you, and please pick up the telephone anytime. Drop in and see us anytime. We're your police department. Remember that. We are a part of you. Thanks. Thank you.